A gaggle of West Coast thespian luminaries have played in a family trilogy directed by the talented Carl Basai. His first film was Mothers and Daughters, followed by Fathers and Sons, and to complete the picture, the last one is called Sisters and Brothers. It is my pleasure to welcome Gabrielle Rose, award-winning actor in film, TV, and on the stage to Studio 4 to tell us more because you're in it. You've been in a few. I've been in all of them. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Carl Basai is a going force. He, uh, he's very inspirational to work with. He approached me about mm, five years ago now, I guess. Uh, myself and Tantu Cardinal and Babs Chula. Chula oh, yeah. Bless her. Bless her soul yes. in the heavens. Babs is with us Hi, now. Hi, Babs. I hope. <laughs> I think she would be. <laughs> She's sitting on my lap. <laughs> I know. She loved it here. <laughs> she did. Mm. Um, and he said he wanted to do a film based on older women, which... It, wasn't Alas. being done at the time, you know, <laughs> with their cracks and bags and mm -hmm. jowls and, and everything and things. And so, would we come up with a story? This was Mothers and Daughters, the first of the trilogy, and um, it was quite a challenge. And I was about to start. I think it was Doubt at the Arts Club, so I only had a day to come up with a story about a mother and a daughter, mm -hmm. and I did. And so we spent the next four or five months developing this film, which eventually became Mothers and Daughters, and that morphed into Fathers and Sons, which was the next film. I played a very small part in that. And, um, and then in the, the final film, he said, well, you have to be in my last film, but I just have a small part for you. And I went, oh, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. I'll come in and I'll be a nurse. Uh, for a day. Because <laughs> so, all girls grow up to be nurses, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we could get into the political ramifications of that later. Mm, all right. Okay. <laughs> but for the story, uh, it was a grisly day like this in January. And I went down to... Um, and Carl had phoned me a couple of times and said, I might make your part a bit bigger, but I didn't take it too seriously. I was just, you know, mm -hmm. directors say that sort of sure. thing, and you don't pay too much attention <laughs> no. until it happens. And uh, I got down to the, 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 um, the space that we were shooting, which was down in the new Olympic Village. Mm. And in my nurse's outfit, and he's <laughs> sitting in the hallway, and he's sort of clutching his head. <laughs> and he said, he said, okay, okay. Uh, meet with me on Monday, and we're going to shoot on Tuesday. And I said, what are you talking about, Carl? And he said, I, he'd just lost a storyline. Somebody had got a great big film down in Costa Rica or some such place. And um, his window for shooting was these 12 days that he was shooting in. Because these stories, they're, they're, they're like short films mm -hmm. They're narratives. Film. Yeah. In so you sense. have, you know, this sister and brother, and you have this mm -hmm. sister and brother, and this brother and brother, and then you have... A, mm -hmm. a couple of sisters. Sure, and it all rings familiar, believe me. If you have a brother or a sister, a sibling, anywhere, you can relate to all these little vignettes. Exactly. Can I They're, call them vignettes? I think that's perfect. They're like little interweaving short films, mm -hmm. all with the theme of sisters and brothers. And, um, and I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, I want you to be one of the stories. And so I went home and mistakenly thought that he meant he wanted me to be one of the sisters, came up with a story that night about a sister and a brother, and uh, emailed that to him. And he went, no, 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 no. <laughs> I want you to be a mother mm. and it to be about two sisters. Come in on Monday and we'll talk about it. So I had a couple of ideas when I came in, and we used a bit of the idea that I'd already come up with. And the two girls, Lena Monroe and uh, Casey Roll, and myself met with Carl in his uh, office. Mm -hmm. And we sat there for the next three hours, made the story, and on Tuesday started to shoot it. It's entirely improvised. All of these films are entirely really? improvised. Really? So it's such an organic process as opposed to here's the script, say these exact lines. Yes, yes. And in the previous incarnation with Mothers and Daughters, we had come up with a story, then we had rehearsed, then we had sort of got an idea of what each scene would entail, where it would build to, where it would go to. On this, we did that, but all in one day. And so we were on the fly. And it worked. I, I w I'm surprised, I saw but it. it worked. It sure did work. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. of course, when you're under the gun like that, you come up with stuff that is sort of mm -hmm. in your body. You can't come I'm up with sure. something that's way if over there. If you're creative like you are. And research it and figure it out. But it has so, mm -hmm. you know. Let I mean, it flow. Yeah. I have a 17-year-old son, and we are often at loggerheads, but love each other fiercely. Mm -hmm. um, I have another son who's 12. So I have an understanding, if not of daughters, but of sons, and of that dynamic that 
can be created. Sure, and they call you when they need something and they don't call when you need them necessarily. All of that, so it all uh, is woven through there. Yes. But uh, this mother you play, Marion, <laughs> she was up to some things, weren't we all? Well, but Marion has a, she's single. She has single a past. Mom. She has a past. <laughs> she has, she, of course, don't we all? I'm burying my head. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How do I justify this story plot, which the audience will find out, I'm sure, in a second. Mm -hmm. In a second, because <laughs> we're going to tell them. Uh, uh, you have a daughter, and she's a typical teenage daughter. Yes. You know, mumpy and... Holding the mother responsible for all the woes of the world. Of course. And wanting to dress with her belly button showing, and the mother says, you're not going out looking like that. Exactly. And she said, yeah. yeah. I'll look however I want to look. I'm 17 or bleep, 16. Bleep, did he bleep, did he bleep? Bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> a, a little bit of the F word in there. Yes. Oh, a few mm. times in this film. Did yeah. You know, once or twice. Well, my mother, well, <laughs> let's not go there. Okay, so, and then uh, the, the twist to the story is... Do you want me to tell? Yeah, you can tell, All because right. I, do, I don't think we spoil it. I don't think so. We do have a clip, but I think you have to set it up just a bit because there's you, Marion, and there's daughter Sarah, and there's an other daughter who shows up. But let's look at the clip, and okay. I think it'll be it'll start to explain telling. It, perhaps. Okay. I'd like to propose a toast. To Sita. And welcome. Okay, I have to. I, I can't. I can't eat before. This is your sister, Sita. Well, not the same father. You both deserve an explanation, and uh, Sarah, I, I was young. I, a lot of stuff had happened in my life, and I was searching for some kind of answer. I joined a, a religious group, a spiritual group, not really, well, yeah, a spiritual group in India. Not a cult. Well, sort of a cult. Yeah, it was sort of, I mean, that was what I Oh, so you and the Rajneesh, or something like that, or, or Vivekananda, or, or one of them. But obviously something happened with him. And where did it all come from? You know, the, we had made the story the day before, and I went, well, there has to be a justification, and it just started to erupt. Mm. <laughs> but the point is that you didn't get to bring the daughter home, I'm thinking. Yes. I won't give it away. No, don't give it away. But uh, she does show up, and surprise, and the look on uh, uh, your, bio well, they're both your biological daughters, yeah, but, but the look on the daughter uh, who doesn't know she has a sister, yes. the look on the face. I know. Tremendous actress. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just had the best cast there. I'm thought. sure. And you said, and you just, I'm sure she's too young to drink, but you probably thought for this moment, go ahead, drink. Yes. <laughs> you know, I and mean. I think my, my character is so, mm -hmm. at this point, on the edge of, madness <laughs> <laughs> having had the the daughter from her past show up mm -hmm. and having had ha and wanted you know having wanted that and at the same time being terrified of exactly. it you know it's that the, the secrets the pandora's box of right? course well i don't think and i could be wrong but you don't have a husband in the house who's surprised no, there seems to be no husband there anywhere. seems to be no husband <laughs> because that is very thorny yes when you haven't told the husband about your past and a, and a child shows up yes who happens to be yours or vice versa well then i think that sarah fills that role of being the husband the of course. Every, everything and mm -hmm. uh, and i mean and certainly this mother is not i mean a lot has changed in editing when you do an improvised film there is tons of footage and they have to take that and make that coherent and so uh, i didn't always have her be a disheveled mess yeah no, but, <laughs> but the editor, uh, brilliant, huh? Yes, brilliant. I mean, a lot of when when films are imp improvised, the editor is king, mm, absolute for sure. king. Uh, someone said in this film and not in your piece that acting is all about work. Oh, yeah, because I think it was the Cory Monteith piece because he is like a. a 
from Glee. Yes. Yes, you know him. I, we, I, I saw, sat next to him at the Toronto Film Festival. Apparently you did. That is quite okay. something, you know. I, I hadn't really understood it being a Canadian actor. Um, we were standing in the hallway, and I suddenly hear, <laughs> you know, this <laughs> screaming. And somebody turns to me and goes, Corey's arrived. And so wherever he went was this mob of screaming 13-year-olds. And he just took it. I mean, he's about seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. He just and took handsome. it. Just so, and handsome. And on Glee. So and he sings. And he sings. And, and he's probably nice, too. He's unbelievably nice. I think Darn. he's from Burnaby or something. Someplace or the, the yeah, island. You know, Isn't he from Victoria? Or maybe he's from Victoria. I think so. Anyway, he's hit the big time. He certainly has. And when someone, and the whole idea of that piece is, I think, uh, when your brother, your sibling, hits the big time and you're a nobody. Yeah. Well, you're really not a nobody. Nobody's a nobody. But you, it's hard to be Diana Krall's sister, I'm sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? O'Brien Adams' sib. Because they're up on the stage getting all the glory. And you have a thing, too, that you want to do. And no one's paying any attention to and you. And you're invisible. Very much so. You know, I mean, when mm -hmm. you become a middle-aged woman, you understand what it becomes, what it's like right. to become invisible. We know about that. <laughs> but you've had your moment in the sun when you're a young, mm -hmm. vibrant, 25-year-old man, and suddenly, and you're with your brother, you're suddenly sure. completely invisible. And it, and it begs the question, does fame change you? And only uh, your closest will know that. Right. If you know what I mean, like if, if uh, you're Madonna, and you knew, went to school with Madonna, and all of that, and if Madonna has a sibling, the sibling will know if she's the same as she always was, or if she's a pain in the neck. Yeah. Now, now yeah. that she's famous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know the answer to that because I'm I Canadian. I wouldn't either. <laughs> well, it's the trouble with being a Canadian actor. Yeah, I know. You don't get rich, but you love what you do. You have to. You yeah. have to. I mean, you know, the, the, the state of the, the art right now in Vancouver is. Very I can't sad. believe, uh, like the demise of the Vancouver Playhouse. The How Playhouse. many times did you play there? Well, you know, I had my very first professional job at the Playhouse. Really? And uh, it was with uh, Paxton Whitehead was the artistic director. Mm -hmm. We were going back forty odd years. Um, Bill Millard was the stage manager. Really? <laughs> of the show. <laughs> How great! And he had just He's now opened Mr. Arts Club. I know. You well, don't he know. had just I know, you opened know. the arts. The arts club had just opened down on Seymour Street, mm -hmm. and he and I would do the show, and then we go over to the arts club and have a drink, and you know, watch the end of the show there. Um, I was nineteen. And uh, and I've you know I didn't do a ton of work at the Playhouse. I was always an arts club person. Yes. But I had brief spates of when Walter mm -hmm. Learning was there. I did three mm -hmm. or four shows, and they at that point they were at the height, and they were did shows out of the Cultch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to have it just preemptively close for. Uh, I was shocked, and know. I'm fairly close to most of the theater people, and I just I knew they were in the glue. In the financial glue, didn't I that knew man say that. that he but could what theater your... company isn't in the glue? I mean, didn't, really? that man, didn't that man that you just had on say that mm -hmm. in ten weeks he could he could get you an extra million dollars or something? Yes, and perhaps we and should that, get him on the theater. Yeah, really, because that is the price yeah. of the the of heart the of a city problem of a cosmopolitan city like this. Really, and uh, somebody said it's about the parking. I said it's not I about the parking. I honestly think people must you can rise park up in and the say building. this can't happen. This is our civic mm -hmm. theater. This is the city that lives downtown. Yeah. We have the arts club. More and more. We have the Bard on the Beach, and we and we need another mm. another theater. We need another theater that does big shows, big shows. Yeah. Not not. Well, especially on a dark and stormy night. Yeah. I mean, I'm mm. doing a show for the Arts Club right now called Scar Tissue, which is oh. uh, uh, my oh, first. Was that time. Michael Ignatieff? Michael Ignatieff wrote the book. I know he wrote yeah. a novel. And uh, and it's it's based, I guess it's semi autobiographical because his mother did die of right. Alzheimer's, but it's fictionalized. And uh, Dennis Foon has adapted that book to stage, Ooh. and we we just started rehearsals. It's a wonderful, okay. wonderful. Will show. you come back and talk about I it? I will. Because we didn't even get to talk about the rest of your life, you know, <gasps> Adam Goyen and uh, the sweet hereafter and all of that. I know. How nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Uh, Gabrielle Rose, Sisters and Brothers, opens Friday, March 23rd, International Village in Tinseltown.